I am continuing the series on what I started, the new series called Strange Doctrines, a uh, series of strange doctrines. And so I've, I've got a list of doctrines that I, I want to get through. And brethren, I've got so many materials. I've got five pages of, of Bible verses. Normally when I prepare a sermon, I've got two or three pages. So the fact that I've got five pages, this could be a two-hour sermon. All right, so what I'm going to do, I, I'm, I've got to get through a lot of passages. I hope you can follow along. Um, if there's a lot to take in, uh, for those that are visiting, this is not the way I normally preach the Bible, okay? But there's a lot to talk about here. And the, the next doctrine that I'll be looking at, well, the title, I'll give you the title for the sermon this evening. And the title for the sermon is The False Doctrine of Angel Procreation. That's what I decided to call it. The False Doctrine of Angel Procreation. What does that mean? Well, some people believe that angels have the ability to bring forth other beings okay and they get this idea from genesis chapter 6. now if you believe this or you've believed this or you know people that believe this you know one thing i want to make very clear this does not mean there's some heretic there's some devil there's some false prophet okay in fact i know many friends that actually believe that angels can bring forth okay uh human beings in fact there's one pastor uh that i sat under his his preaching for many 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 years um, and he believes that angels can bring forth. So, you know, there's, there's nothing wicked about him. I mean, you know, he, he's a godly man serving the Lord. You know, this is not like the oneness. Well, you looked at the first sermon on oneness, which is another Jesus. You know, anything to do with another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. You know, mark it down. That person is unsaved and they're teaching damnable heresies. Okay. Now, I don't believe this is a damnable heresy. Okay. I do believe it's false doctrine. Okay. I do believe that is a, a false doctrine. And so I want to cover with you uh, why people believe this. I hope I give a good presentation of it. And also why I don't believe this and why I don't think this is the right position to hold that angels can bring forth. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, uh, sorry, chapter, chapter 6 and verse number 1 there. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth that daughters were born unto them. So we see daughters here, verse number 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So you see here, the sons of God are taking these daughters as wives. Now, the, the position of the angel procreation is that the sons of God mentioned here are angels. And not so much heavenly angels, but fallen angels. Angels that uh, do not have, have, this, have looked upon women, have desired these women, and they've decided to basically take these women as their wives. Look at verse number three. And the Lord uh, said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And then verse number four, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. So the position there is that angels have come into the daughters of men, and they bear children to them. So you can see there is procreation in this union. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, there are different, you know, when people believe something, you can't just lump everybody in the same category. And that's something I've learned for many years, okay? Now, those that believe that angels can procreate, you know, some believe that this procreation were these giants that are mentioned in verse number four. So there was this sort of hybrid uh, human, half angel kind of being walking the earth. Some people believe that, but not everybody that believes that angels can procreate believe that. Okay, and I'm not going to touch upon the giants at this point in time, the, the doctrine of Nephilim, because I just got too much material to cover. That's not the main scope of what I wanted to cover today. The scope is, can angels procreate? Okay, that's the scope of my sermon. And so you see here, the sons of God, i.e. angels, as it's you know, seen by these uh, people that believe this, they've taken these daughters of men, taken wives, and had children with these women. Okay, now if you've never heard that before, it might sound a little bit weird. I, I personally don't believe it's going to be your natural reading. Uh, my first introduction to this doctrine that angels can procreate, I was about 19 years old. And I had already read my Bible extensively. You know, and the way I learned it was by somebody else sharing me a link on the internet basically, listening to some things and hearing, oh, some people believe this doctrine. Most people that I talk to that hold this position, when I ask them, Where, how did you get to this point? Essentially, it's the internet. Like essentially, they've gone online, they've seen a video. It's not something that has come out of their natural reading. That, that's my experience anyway. Okay, I'm not saying everybody's like that. That's just what I've experienced, okay? Now, where did they get this idea from? So keep your finger, or you don't have to keep your finger there. We will come back to Genesis 6 later on. But go to Job 38 for me, please. Go to Job 38. And again, I'm going to be going quickly for these passages. So please forgive me if I don't give you much time. But Job 38 and verse number 4. Job 38 and verse number 4. We have the Lord God speaking to Job. And he's definitely speaking about creation at this point in time. In Job 38, verse number 4, 
it says, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? So I'm sure, you know, immediately by looking at that question, yeah, that's about creation. That's about God's creation. Does the earth have foundation? What does this mean? Is it literally just symbolic? Well, the Lord knows. Okay. I mean, and then it says, declare if thou hast understanding. Who have laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who have stretched a line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So they say, well, if this is about creation, I do believe it's about creation, but I'll, I'll give you some further understanding soon. Who are these sons of God shouting for joy when God is creating? Because we know that God did not create man until day number six. Okay. And we know earth was created on day number one. All right. So who are these sons of God shouting for joy? The thought here is these cannot be human beings. These must be the angels of heaven. And so you can see here in Job, they're called the sons of God. These angels, these heavenly hosts are called the sons of God. Therefore, when you go to Genesis chapter six, you see the sons of God there. These angels taking these women as wives. Now, can you also now go to the New Testament and go to Jude uh, verse number six, go to the book of Jude and verse number six. Another passage that is used to prop up this doctrine is in Jude verse number six. Jude verse number six, which reads, and the angels, so it's definitely about angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. So the idea is, well, let's see, these angels have left heaven. He have reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, until the judgment of the great day. So what is it? Why are these angels being judged? Well, they look at verse number seven, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So the idea is, well, why is it that these angels are being judged by God? Well, because, you know, they look at the Sodom and Gomorrah there. You know, as you know, the, the Sodomites here went after strange flesh. The men went after men. The women went after women. And so therefore, the angels themselves must have gone after strange flesh. And so when they read Jude, Jude verse number 6, they look at verse number 7, and they tie these two thoughts together. And again, I can understand that mentality. I can understand where that's coming from. Especially if you're trying to build this sermon together, and, uh, sorry, this doctrine together and prop it up with other passages. Can you now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 10? And I, and I will go back to these verses later on and, and give you my explanation to them all. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 10. The amount of people that I've spoken to that are confused by verse number 10 surprises me because I don't think it's even that confusing. All right. I mean, I was never confused with this as a child, uh, but I, I realized later this, this should be something we're confused about, but I don't think so. I think it's very clear. But anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 10, it says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. So the power here is basically a, a male authority, whether it's a husband or it's a father. Okay. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Wink, wink. You know, the angels, that they, they, they're attracted to women. And so the, we've got to make sure that the women are under the authority of their fathers or their husbands so that these angels, these, you know, cannot take them as wives. That's the thought there. Why would the angels be mentioned here? You know, because they're attracted to women is, is the conclusion with all these passages together. So as I understand it, these are the major verses to teach that angels can procreate, that they're attracted to women. Uh, you know, especially women that don't have an authority overhead for some reason, but they're attracted to women. They can marry these women, women, and they can bring forth children uh, together. Okay, and I believe that is a, a false doctrine. And again, I, I was uh, confronted with this. I was, I was about 19 or 20 years old, I think, when I was confronted with this doctrine. And my immediate thought was, well, yeah, kind of, I can see where that, you know, you can, you can sometimes look at different doctrines and understand where people are coming from. I understand where people are coming from. Like, I, you know, this is, this is why I, I realized that, you know, it's not like people are like intentionally trying to do evil or, or confuse people or, or lie. It's not that. Sometimes you can see things in the Bible. And yes, you know, I can see how, you know, bringing all these verses together, it may look like that angels can procreate with women. But, you know, as a, as a 19, 20 year old, you know, again, I, I had the blessing of growing up in church my entire life and reading my Bible from a very young age. You know, my mum would read me the Bible, you know, when I, was a little, when I couldn't read the Bible. You know, she'd read the Bible to me when, when I go to bed, things like that. And, you know, every now and again, when I hear something and it sounds unusual to me, it might take me a little bit of time, but I, I immediately can think of a verse sometimes that will kind of destroy that idea. OK, and I remember just being 19 or 20 years old. The first thought that came to me, well, didn't Jesus speak about angels and about getting married? 
And so let's have a look at some of these passages. If you can please go to Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 30. Matthew 22 and verse number 30. Matthew 22 and verse number 30. So this is a verse that just popped in my mind when I started to consider this doctrine. In Matthew 22 verse 30, speaking about us human beings that are saved, it says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Okay, so we learn that we will not be married in heaven. You know, thank God for my wife. I get to enjoy her on this earth, you know, till uh, death do us part. But when I'm in heaven, I'm not going to be married to my wife anymore. Okay, but then it says, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So in what way are we like the angels of God in heaven? That we neither marry. The angels marry, human beings aren't married in heaven. Okay, another passage, you don't need to turn there, Mark 12, 25, basically the same thing. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Okay, now to me that's settled it. Right? Okay, yep, that verse, yeah, that can't, you know, you know surely, because remember, it, it's not just fornication. These, these uh, sons of God are taking wives. Wives is a term for marriage, okay, between husband and wife. Now, can you please turn to Luke chapter 20 and verse number 34? Because the argument that I heard against this is, well, it says there that the angels that don't get married are the angels which are in heaven. So they're the good angels. But the angels that left their first estate, that left heaven and went to the earth to procreate with women, they're not in heaven anymore, therefore they can be married. That are, that's, the, that's the position that I've heard there. Well, to me, I, you know, again, you, you, and I'm, I'm trying to teach this to the men on Fridays, we'll definitely cover this topic at some point. You know, when you build a doctrine, you build it on something the Bible says. Okay, if, if the angels are not married in heaven, you can't just, well, God didn't say that it can't be, can't be married on the earth. I mean, that's silence now. And you're building this doctrine on a silent position. Now, again, silence can be correct, can be, but it can also be very incorrect. Okay, so whenever you build doctrine, you know, it's just a lesson for everybody. Make sure you have a clear black and white scripture stating that truth. Okay, now, if we have a look at, uh, where did I get to turn, sorry, uh, Luke 20, verse number 34. So it's like, well, the angels in heaven, they don't get married. Well, Luke 20, 34, it says, and, Jesus, and it's the same, same topic. Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. Neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So now we see that, you know, when we go to heaven, we're equal to angels. In what sense? Number one, that we cannot die. So angels are immortal. They cannot die. Just like us, when we're saved, we go to heaven, our new resurrected bodies, we cannot die. What else are we equal with angels? That we're not given in marriage. This time, it doesn't say the angels which are in heaven. Okay, it just as angels, you know, comma. Okay, or whatever, what is there? You know, uh, semicolon. Okay, so to say, well, it says angels over here. Uh, sorry, it says heaven over here. Well, over here, it doesn't say heaven. It just says angels. Okay, so to me, that should be sufficient. The angels do not get given into marriage, and therefore the angels in Genesis 6 uh, cannot be the ones, the sons of God here, getting married to these women. Okay, can you please turn to Genesis chapter 2 now? Turn to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24. Because the other position will be, well, you know, you know, why is it that angels can't get married? Do, do we have a strong position on this? And, and I, I do believe, you know, that when you read the Bible, you know, that you need to be systemic in the way you read. So when you get to Genesis chapter 6, again, you should have read Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, Genesis 4, Genesis 5, and these chapters keep building off each other. Now, I, I truly believe that's the best way to read the Bible. You know, I, I, I got into the habit once when I was younger to when I studied the Bible, I would just look at, okay, this verse over here, this verse over there, this verse over here, this verse over here, forgetting the context, forgetting all the chapters that come before it. And when I got right on that, it cleared up a lot of just confusion that I had. But in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24, we get the definition of biblical godly marriage. Okay, in Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So marriage is the definition here of a man leaving his former family, his father and mother, creating a new family, cleaving unto his wife. Marriage is one man and one wife. 
It is not one man and several wives or one, uh, several men and one wife. It's not two men. It's not two wives. And I know our nation has corrupted it. I know they voted in homo marriage, same-sex marriage, whatever they call it. But brethren, I don't care what this world calls it. God would not call that marriage. You know, I mean, if God's presence was here, he would not look at two legally binding uh, homosexuals and say, well, that's marriage. And the reason I say that is because when we go back to Genesis chapter 6, go back there, please. Go back to Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 2. Like, I, I know the Sodomites call what they're doing marriage. I, I know they call it marriage, but God would not call it marriage. Okay, so when we go to Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 2, these are the words of God. Like, these are not the words coming from a, a wicked generation of wicked people. It's, it's the words of the Holy Spirit. He's the narrator of the Bible. And he says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So it's the Holy Spirit deciding to use the term wife, meaning there's a marriage taking place. And we should have read Genesis chapter 2, which we learn that God's definition of marriage, the Holy Spirit's definition of marriage, is between one man and one wife. Okay, so point number one, and I know this is probably not enough to convince anybody of this position, but point number one is angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. Okay, so I do believe it is a false doctrine. This angel, angel procreation is a false doctrine because angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. All right, now I've got four major points basically why angels cannot procreate. Can you please now turn to Hebrews chapter uh, 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 13. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 13. And again, for the men, we were discussing this on a Friday night about what are the differences with angels and men and uh, animals and do animals have a soul and do angels have a body, all these kinds of things we were talking about, right? Anyway, Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 13. It says, But to which of the angels, okay, said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make, make thine enemies thy footstool. And then it says this, Are they not all ministering, what? Spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. What do we learn about the angels? They are all ministering spirits. Okay? They are spirits. Now, when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, you know, we had doubt in Thomas and a few people not believing whether he was resurrected. Well, when Christ comes before his disciples and, pre pre you know, presents himself, you know, it's like, you know, touch me, feel me, you know, see the holes of my, of my hands, these kinds of things. And then he says in Luke 24, verse 39, Jesus Christ says these words, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. Then he says these words, For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. I mean, that is definitive, as far as I'm concerned. Jesus Christ says that spirits do not have flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Okay? So Christ is telling us that spirits do not have a physical body. I mean, I don't know how much clearer that can be. Again, when you're building doctrines, you want things to be black and white in Scripture. All right? So, of course, if angels are going to procreate with women, they're going to need a physical body body. Wouldn't, wouldn't they need a physical body? Well, God says they don't have a physical body. They're not flesh and bone. Okay? They are ministering spirits. So point number two is angels have no flesh and bone. Okay? In, in accordance to Jesus' words right there. Angels do not have flesh and bone. Okay? Now you might say, well, Pastor Kevin, I, I know there are times that angels physically manifest. And of course we see this stuff in the Bible. You know, we can entertain angels unawares. You know, people come in, we, we might entertain angels. Angels may come in in the midst and we may physically see them. We may even be able to physically feed them, okay? And we see things like this happen even in, in the Bible. You know, for example, when uh, um, Lot was pulled out of Sodom before God destroyed it, he sent two angels, which Lot clearly saw, which the people of the city clearly saw, okay? And they were pulled out of that city, so there was a tangibleness, there was a physical form that happened when these angels took Lot out of the city. So how do we reconcile then the words of Jesus that spirits do not have flesh and bone with these angels that definitely had some type of physical, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like body, some, physical, some type of physical body. Well, first of all, 
If you want to reconcile these things, number one, the answer is that the tangible physical form that these angels came in was not flesh and bone. I mean, it may have looked like flesh and bone, but if we're going to hold true to what Jesus said, you know, these, these angels may, their physical form may not have even been flesh and bone. Okay? I mean, to, to suggest then that they were able to procreate with women, that they had all their organs in place and everything that, that's needed, you know, the seed of man uh, in that body, I just don't know why, what purpose it would hold for these angels to have, basically, right? But anyway, that, you know, well, did they, maybe their physical form was not flesh and bone. But second, the second answer to, to, to this is, well, let's say it was flesh and bone. These appearances of angels are an exception. They're exceptional circumstances. So it does appear that God allows angels from time to time to appear in the physical realm. Okay, but their natural makeup is not flesh and bone. Their natural makeup is pure spirit. Okay, and, and God allows from time to time, as we read in the Bible, for them to have a physical form. Now here's the thing about this. The only time we read about angels having a physical form where they can be seen and touched, what kind of angels are they? They're always, always, without a doubt, angels doing the work of God. Always. You, you never see a fallen angel, you never see a devil, an uh, 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 evil spirit, you know, coming forth and presenting itself in a physical, tangible form. It doesn't happen. The only angels that are in tangible form are d good angels, if you want to call it that. You know, holy angels doing the work of God. Uh, you know, and then, you know, I'm supposed to believe that, well, these fallen angels also, you know, were able to take on a physical form. We have no other evidence of that. You know, if we were to take the words of Christ seriously, that they are not flesh and bone. Can you please turn to Genesis chapter 1? Genesis chapter 1, verse number 11. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 11. So very quickly, the two points so far. Number one, angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. Number two, angels have no flesh and bone. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Remember, when we get to Genesis chapter 6, we should have read Genesis chapter 1. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 11, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. We learn something very important here, that well, we soon see that everything that God creates uh, on the earth can bring forth, but it can only bring forth after its kind. And the only way it can bring forth after its kind, if it has the seed in it itself. Okay? Now we see that seed here, and we're going to talk about the seed of man eventually, but drop down to verse number 21 here, please. Uh, actually, verse number 12, verse number 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Okay, drop down to verse number 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So how is it that you can bring forth after your kind? You, again, you have to have that seed. Okay, and with human beings, uh, the male has the seed to fertilize that egg, right? In, let's drop down to verse number 24, Genesis chapter 1, verse number 24. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeped upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. I mean, why would God have to repeat this over and over again? That everything brings forth after its kind. Okay? There's, there's a great truth there. There's a great truth. Okay? This destroys evolution. You know, that, 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 a, that a fish can bring forth a, a frog, and a frog can bring forth a, a dog, and a dog can bring forth a, an ape, and an ape can bring forth a human being. That cannot happen. Okay? If, if we believe Genesis 1, everything must bring forth after its own kind. Look, drop down to verse number 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now God doesn't say here that man will bring after his own kind. Okay, But I think we understand the concept here. We start with the seed and, and bring it forth every time. The, 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 the nature, the, the, the uh, trees, and then the animals, you know, the sea animals, the land animals. And then God says to Adam and Eve, you basically bring forth after your own kind. You be fruitful and multiply. Okay? So, point number three here, 
You know, if it's angels taken, you know, a heavenly host, okay, which are, you know, I think everyone would agree was a separate creation to human beings. How can these two procreate then if they're not the same kind? We learn a very fundamental truth. Everything must bring forth after its own kind. It must have the same seed that is able to fertilize that egg. All right? You take the seed of a, and I'm sorry if this is not, you know, I, I don't, but you know, take a seed of a dog and you plant it into a cat. Guess what? It's not going to bring forth. Okay? Because God's laws do not allow that to happen. Okay? And so to think that angels can with, have, generate some type of seed that can bring forth uh, children through a human woman is in conflict with the, the, the laws of God that we see here that everything brings after its own kind. And so point number three, why angels cannot procreate is because angels cannot produce after mankind. Angels cannot produce after mankind, otherwise we have a major issue, major problem, major contradiction in Genesis chapter 1. The very first chapter of the Bible. I, I, I don't want to mess up chapter 1. Because, I mean, if there's contradictions in chapter 1, how can I trust the rest of the Bible? You know? Can you please now turn to Hebrews chapter 1? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 4. So number one was angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. Number two, angels have no flesh and bone. Number three, angels cannot produce after mankind. And in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 4, here the angels are being compared to Jesus Christ. And it says here in verse number 4, being made so much better than the angels. Is Jesus Christ so much better than the angels? Amen. Okay. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Boy, what more excellent name did Christ receive? Verse number 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So what is this excellent name that Christ has? Well, the fact that He is the Son of the Father, that He is the Son of God, and this gives Him much greater authority and much more excellence than any angels that are on, you know, in heaven or on the earth or whatever. Okay? And so verse number 5 is basically saying that God has never said to the angels, Thou art my son. I've, I've never called the angels my son. I've never said I'm a father to the angels and the angels are my son. God never said this to the angels. Okay? But if Genesis chapter 6 is about angels and they're called the sons of God, you can say, well, hold on, God, in Hebrews chapter 1, there was a time that you called the angels your sons. Back in Genesis chapter 6. Well, that would be a contradiction in your Bible. Okay? So, you know what? Number four, point number four is angels have never been called God's sons. So when I read Genesis 6 and I see that the sons of God, you know, took wives, well, how, why would I conclude that that is angels? Because that would be contradictive to the scriptures. So brethren, you know, um, I've got a lot more to cover. I'm only halfway through the sermon, right? But got half an hour, good. We're half an hour in, okay? But I could finish right here. Like, to me, this is sufficient evidence that angels cannot procreate. Like, to me, this is just enough. Enough black and white scriptures, you know, explaining the nature of angels. They never called, well, what are the four points? Number one, angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. Number two, angels have no flesh and bone. Number three, angels cannot produce after mankind. Number four, angels have never been called God's son. And I, I just, to me, it's done. Like, th that Genesis 6 idea, you know, was, 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 you know, produced a good Bible study. You know, it was good to dash around some ideas and think about certain things, learn some greater things about angels, learn some greater things about the Son of God. And to me, I, I should just wrap up the sermon here. Okay. But, you know, those that hold to this position do have other verses that they've turned to. And I, I've covered some of those at the very beginning of this sermon. So again, I, the, the reason I'm going for this strange doctrine uh, series is because these are things that I've heard taught in church. Okay, churches that I've been part of, I'm saying, okay, where I've sat in the pew and I've heard this stuff, you know, or uh, I'm familiar with churches that have taught uh, similar uh, things. So I'm going to address some of the thoughts that these preachers have brought up to address what, no, angels can also be the sons of God, okay? So let's uh, go to Luke chapter 3, please. Luke chapter 3 and verse number 38. Luke chapter 3 and verse number 38. So in Luke chapter 3, we have a genealogy of Jesus Christ. Okay, if you know the genealogy, you know, one genealogy in Matthew says, you know, begat him, begat, 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 begat. Well, the genealogy in Luke chapter 3 has, he's the son of, 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 okay? And when you look at Luke chapter 3, verse number 38, 
It says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So we learn here that Adam in Luke chapter 3 is called the son of God. So the thought here is, well, hold on. Is there another way? Because we know that when Adam was created, he was not in a sinful state. He did not need to be saved, as it were. And we know when we get saved, we, we, we become sons of God. So, you know, is there another way to be called the son of God? We can see here Adam is being called the son of God. Well, to me, the answer is, shouldn't be that complicated. Like, he did get saved. Like, the, the first man that got saved was Adam. You know, I mean, I think that's sufficient. I, I don't think I need to dig in a, a deeper meaning about this, okay? But the preacher said, basically, well, you can see that being called a son of God uh, can, you know, can also apply to those that are created directly by God. Not procreated, you know, by union between man and woman, but when you're created immediately directly by God, maybe this is another, another way that you can be called the son of God. Now, the reason they say this, well, the preacher has said this, is because we know when Adam was created, the Bible says he was created in the image of God. Amen? Uh, no complaints there. It does say that Adam was created in the image of God. And the thought there is, well, maybe the reason he can be, he can be called the Son of God is because he was created in the image of God. This same preacher then took, you know, uh, uh, stated that angels are also created in the image of God. Where angels are not physically created in the image of God, but they are spiritually created in the image of God. Now, brethren, I, you know, when someone makes a statement like that, especially in a, behind a church pulpit, you kind of expect that there's going to be a verse that proves that point. I mean, I hope you have that expectation. When someone makes a statement, they have verses or a verse to prove that point. You know, I spent like 10 minutes going through my Bible, going on Google. Where does the Bible say that the angels were created in the image of God? Because I was kind of I think it's surely they wouldn't lie about this. You know what? There is no references at all in your Bible that says angels were created in, in the image of God. Okay. Now, why am I saying all these things? Because the position of this preacher was basically this. If be, cre being created in the image of God allows you to be called the son of God, i.e. Adam, and angels were created spiritually in the image of God, well, then they too can be called the sons of God. And the statement of this preacher is that this unlocks the door to believe that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are angels. This opens the door. So let me use an illustration here. I know the people online can't watch this, but use your imagination. So here's the door. You know, okay? To, if, if, I, if I enter this door, I'm going to believe that the angels procreated in Genesis 6. Okay? Now, before I can go into that door, I have to unlock it. Okay? So I, I need a key to unlock this door. Okay? Now this key, basically, angels uh, created in the image of God, number one. And the other thing on this key is, well, Adam is called the son of God because he was created in the image of God. So because I've got this key, this allows me to open the door. I can't even open the door. There we go. And I can enter in. Well, I just say, you know, keep that door closed because that key doesn't fit. Okay? That key doesn't fit. The reason, number one, it doesn't fit is because there is nowhere in the Bible, as I said, that angels are referred to being created in the image of God. There is nowhere in the Bible that says such a thing. So the, fit is, the, the key is already faulty. Okay? Secondly, the preacher said that Adam could be created called the uh, Son of God because he was created in the image of God. And then he concludes that no other man is, is created in the image of God. Only Adam. Okay, now let me... Uh, did I get to turn to Genesis 5? No. Okay, go to Genesis 5. Let me just show you why the position, his position was basically that no other man is created in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 5, verse number 3... Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 3, it says, And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own image, after his image, and called his name Seth. So the, uh, the preacher's position was, well, uh, you know, Adam was created in the image of God, but when Adam had kids, they were not created in the image of God, they were created in the image of Adam. And therefore, myself, as a man here, uh, I'm not created in the image of God, is the conclusion basically here, but I'm created in the image of my father. Okay? Major problem there. Major problem there. Please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 10. I'm just trying to show you this is a faulty key. That door needs to remain closed. Okay? <laughs> that key opens nothing. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 10. Sorry. 
verse number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 7. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. So this is men in general. Okay, we should not have long hair is basically what this is teaching. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So look, this is not about Adam. This is about every man. Okay, a man, it says here, is the image and glory of God. Every man. Okay, now here's the problem. To say that, well, you can also be called the son of God because you're created in the image of God. Well, that means every single man walking this earth right now, saved or unsaved, even reprobate, you can call them a son of God because they were created in the image of God. See the major problems this stuff creates. You know, I mean, this is the stuff with false doctrine. You know, you, you don't really know all the time. You know, you, it sounds good. It sounds legitimate. It doesn't seem like it's going to cause any major issues, but it does create a little bit of a divide, just a little crack somewhere in your doctrine, in your standing on the Bible. Look, I'm sure I'm not perfect on every doctrine. You know, I'm not here saying I'm perfect. I know everything. I'm always right. But one thing as you begin to study different doctrines, you notice little cracks. Those cracks become major chasms eventually. Okay, and this will lead to the idea that every man, no matter who you are, you're a son of God. Okay, and then we have the problem of sons of God being cast into hell or being made reprobate, you know, and uh, you know, it, it all of a sudden you're going to have to reinterpret all other passages of the Bible, all other doctrines to fit this doctrine. Okay, now let's in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 10. So I hope I, I, I explained to you there is not an, another way to be called the son of God. Okay, in the image of God, that's, that's a faulty argument. That's a faulty key. It does not open any doors except false doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 10. So the question is, well, what about this one, right? We read it. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Wink, wink. You know, the angels, they're attracted to the women. You know, so this is why they need to have authority over their heads. Okay, but how does a woman having authority over her head, let's say her father, stop an angel, if this is a true doctrine, you know, taking the form of a man, you know, wooing a woman, getting married to her. Like, how's a father's authority going to stop that? I mean, I mean, what, what is it? Like, normally a father, yeah, a father has authority over his daughter. And then when he finds a, a good man, he hands out, you know, hopefully it's a good man, you know, hands his, his uh, daughter uh, to be married. I mean, that's the proper process, right? I mean, why would that, just having power over the woman, stop these angels from trying to take them as their wives? Okay, so what is this about? Well, let's start there in verse number 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3. Again, when something is a little bit unusual, uh, unsure about, again, you just read the context. And I believe the context answers this so easily. Like, it, it, this is not even an issue, in my opinion. Okay, verse number 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. We see this authority structure. God the Father is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman. Okay, that's whether it's his wife or whether it's his daughter. Okay, this is the proper process. Uh, husbands, you are the head of your wife, you are the head of your home. But it says here, verse number four Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that pray or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is for that is even all one as she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Uh, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. This is basically teaching us, uh, teaching that women should have long hair because this represents the authority that man has over the woman. Again, this is within the DNA of a woman. You know, women in general, even un in ungodly, you know, uh, God-forsaken countries, they still have their hair long because they understand this concept just within their nature. Okay, but let's keep going there in verse number seven. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created. Did I miss something? No, I haven't. Verse number nine. Yeah, verse number nine. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So what, what verse number eight and nine is saying? Just because a man is authority of a woman, it doesn't mean the man is better. Okay, because it says, verse number 8, For the man is not, of the, is, not, is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman of the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. So for this reason, she ought to have authority over her head because of the angels. Okay, so why would you mention angels here? Because the angels have authority over their head as well. That's all. It's just about authority. Okay, we already mentioned Christ. We mentioned God just before that. 
the angels are also in subjection to Christ and to the Father. Okay, So in the same way that the angels are under the authority of God, so too should a woman be under the authority of the man. Again, this is not about men being better than women, because it says in verse number uh, 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, because men cannot exist without the woman, because she's got to give birth to, them, to the man. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. So in the Lord, there's no one greater. Like, men are not better than women. In the Lord, we're all one. Okay, there is... There, we're all one in the Lord, okay? That it's just because someone's got authority doesn't mean they're better than someone else that is, you know, uh, of a different sex, okay? Verse number 12, For as the woman is of the man, so is the man also of the woman, but all things of God. All things of God, including the angels that I just mentioned there. Okay, now I, I understand because of the angels, basically says because of that fact, you know, and it's up to you now to use, use your imagination. What does that mean? Does that mean the angels are attracted to women? Is that what God's trying to, you know, just, just fit into that passage? Or is this passage about authority, authority structure? And that God, as it says in verse number 12, all things of God, everything is under the power of God. I mean, to me, this is not difficult. You know, it's language that we wouldn't normally speak, but the Bible many times uses language and phraseology that we wouldn't normally say. We wouldn't normally say things a certain way. But again, you keep things within the context. I think it's very clear here that the angels are under the authority of God. This is not talking about the angels being attracted to women. Okay. Now let's go to the book of Jude. Jude, verse number four, please. Jude, verse number four. What about Jude? Verse number four. Jude, verse number four. Because we saw that the angels did not keep their first estates, and then it said even as Sodom and Gomorrah went after strange flesh. What kind of strange flesh did the angels go after then in the book of Jude? Well, look at Jude number 4, and I'll explain to you where the confusion is. Okay? In verse number 4 it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse number four, what we learn here, that this is about false prophets, okay? About false teachers, okay? Now, what we're about to read in verse number five, verse number six, and verse number seven, the author, Jude, is basically going back to something that has occurred and assigning that or, or likening these false prophets to these other wicked people that, that, uh, that exist here, okay? Let's have a look at verse number five. I will therefore put you in remembrance... Though ye once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. What is this about? You may remember when, when uh, Moses led the, uh, Ju uh, the Israelites out of Egypt, you know, he went to be with the Lord, and while he was away, the, the people of Israel, they created a, a false god, the, the golden calf, and people danced about and worshipped it. Well, those that decided to keep worshipping the false god God ultimately ended up destroying all those people, okay? So these are people that worship false gods. So what are we seeing here? The false prophet is being compared to those that worship false gods in verse number five, okay? So verse number five has to do with verse number four, okay? The false prophet is being compared to these that uh, the Lord God destroyed. Look at verse number six. And the angels which kept not their first estates but left their own habitation he have reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So we, what we have in verse number six, again, the false prophets have been compared to these angels that left the first estate. Say, so Pastor Kevin, what is that all about? Look, ultimately the Bible does not give us a lot about the spiritual realm. Like, you're not just constantly reading about stories of angels and what they get up to. You know, when it comes to the spiritual realm, a lot of that, yeah, we get bits and pieces, but God does not give us great stories of what took place in the spiritual realm. You know, it's mainly about man's relationship with God and how the Lord uses angels, you know, to help minister to us in our, in our service for God. And so, look, I don't fully understand, but one thing we definitely see here that these angels did wrong, okay, it wouldn't be the first time we know that Satan did the same thing, and they're held in the chains of darkness, everlasting chains of darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. But verse number six, these angels that are going to be judged by God on that great day are being compared to the false prophet, okay? Verse number six is comparing, not verse number five or verse number seven, verse number six is comparing to verse number four about the false prophets. And then verse number seven, even as 
Well, that must be about the angels. They must be even as, no, the false prophets, even as, verse number 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah, the whole chapter, the whole book of Jude is about false prophets, okay? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So what do we learn? That's about Sodom and Gomorrah, the homosexuals, the Sodomites, where God destroyed them. And again, they're being compared to the false prophet. Okay. Now, again, those that believe angels can procreate will basically take verse number 6 and verse number 7 and combine those two things. And they'll say verse number 7 is about verse number 6. Okay? But what I'm saying to you, and I'll prove this to you soon, is that verse number 4 is about the false prophets. Verse number 5 is comparing those that uh, were judged of God, the, the ones that came out of Egypt, to the false prophet. Verse number 6, the angels that left the first uh, estate are being compared to the false prophet. And verse number 7, those, the Sodomites, are being compared to the false prophet. So these three groups are not being compared amongst themselves. These three groups are being compared to the false prophets in verse number 4. Okay? Now I'll prove that further if you go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Because 2 Peter chapter 2 is a parallel passage to Jude. Okay? It's almost identical. You compare these two things. It's, it's amazing how uh, you know, identical these passages are. And again, uh, these angels are mentioned once again, and the Sodomites are mentioned once again in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1. Let's have a look at this. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people. So you can see here in verse number 1, it's about false prophets. Okay, Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily bring, uh, bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destructions. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feign words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now for of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Okay, so verse number one, two, three, about false prophets. Now we get into these, these groups once again, okay? Verse number four. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So there's those angels again that left their first um, estate, okay? Left their habitation. They, they're being mentioned again. So again, these, these angels are being compared to the false prophets. You see that? Now, in Jude, immediately after the angels, it says, even so, so those that liken to put those together will say, well, see, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, going after strange flesh. But notice in 2 Peter chapter 2, the Lord separates these two groups. Okay? And I, I love this because when you compare Scripture to Scripture, you realize, oh, God's not, liking, not, not combining the, the angels with Sodom, but these are different groups that are being compared to the false prophets. And 2 Peter chapter 2 confirms this for us because in verse number 5, again, it doesn't go into Sodom and Gomorrah, but verse number 5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world, uh, upon the world of the ungodly. So you can see those that perished in Noah's flood, the ungodly, they're being compared to the false prophet. Okay? And sandwiched between that was the mention of the angels. Now after the flood, verse number 6, it says, And turn the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, now we have the Sodomites mentioned again, into ashes condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should, uh, should live ungodly, that after should live ungodly. So you can see there, when you look at the false prophets mentioned in verses 1 to 3, that they're being compared to verse number 4, those angels that left their first estate, verse number 4, as the people that perished in the flood of Noah, and verse number 6, as the Sodomites. And you can see that the Sodomites and the angels are being separated by the story of the flood. Okay, So uh, that's why I like it, because you can see that these are three different groups being compared to the false prophet. They're not, the Lord is not associating or merging these two different groups. I hope that makes sense. I, I don't know. I've got a lot to talk about. I hope it, it makes sense with what I'm explaining. Okay, next one is, well, what about Job 38? Can we please go back to Job? Actually, go to Job chapter 1 for me. Go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. If I go over an hour a little bit, brethren, please forgive me once again, okay? There's a lot to talk about. Job chapter 1 and verse number 6. Job chapter 1 and verse number 6. It says, Now, there was a day when the sons of God, well, who are these sons of God, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Well, we know that Satan is an anointed cherub. And, uh, you know, we often associate cherubs with angels because they've got these wings. And then we've got the sons of God presenting themselves and Satan's coming along. Well, they can see, well, these must be angels, they think, right? Heavenly hosts and, and Satan's hanging along. 
Well, I'm saying to you that sons of God are not angels. God never said to an angel that they are, you are my son. Okay, thou art my son. He's never said those words. Okay. You know, what I'm putting forward to, to you, and I'll prove this later on, that the sons of God here are believers. Amen. Believers that are in heaven. Okay, and they're presenting themselves before the Lord. Now you might say, well, why would Satan come along, you know, with them? Well, drop down to verse number 11, Job chapter 1, verse number 11. It says, you know, God and Satan start talking about Job. And this is what Satan says about Job. Because, you know, God says basically Job is, you know, is a, is a great man, is a faithful man, all these kinds of things. And then Satan says about Job in verse number 11, But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. So God is praising Job, you know, if you know the context. Satan comes along, yeah, just because you blessed him. But if you don't bless him anymore, you take away everything he has, he's going to curse you to your face, God. That's what Satan does. Okay, and in Revelation chapter 12, you don't have to turn there, verse number 20, uh, 12, verse number 10, Revelation 12, 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Every day and night, Satan is up there accusing the brethren to God. And so what we see here in Job chapter 1 verse uh, 11, once again, Satan is accusing day and night. He's always, he's constantly in heaven, going back to God. Did you know brother so-and-so did this? Did you know Job, did, did you know Pastor Kevin did this? He's the accuser of the brethren. So it makes perfect sense that as the sons of God present themselves, there comes along Satan to say a few nasty words. Okay? Now, go to Job 38 for me, please. Job 38 verse number 4. Job 38 verse number 4. Sebastian, can you just give me a drink of water? <clears throat> Thank you, son. Job 38, verse number 4. So, the Lord God asks these great questions to Job and, and just demonstrating his greatness, his holiness, you know, his majesty. And he says in verse number 4, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Question. Declare if thou hast understanding. Who have laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Question. Or who have stretched a line upon it? Question. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Question. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So if this is all about creation, and I believe a big chunk of it is about creation, then with the question should naturally come, who are the sons of God here? Shouting for joy when God created all things because once again we saw that God did not create man until day number six. Well, this is where, you know, sometimes the Bible requires a bit of, like, a bit of work, okay? I'm not talking about twisting scriptures, but it's just about understanding that, you know, when God speaks, that there is often a greater truth. You know, I had said on, on Sunday that the Bible is Christ-centric. It's Christ-centric. You know, the Bible is constantly pointing us to Christ. Christ uh, is found in every book of the Bible. Every prophet, you know, prophesied and spoke of Jesus Christ, whether symbolically, prophetically, sometimes they didn't even know themselves. You know, we, we, we've been given the New Testament to, to reveal us uh, this greater understanding. So when we look at this uh, in verse number 6, whereupon are the foundations that are fastened? And I do believe we're talking about the foundations of the earth here. But then it says, and who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, does the earth have a cornerstone? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> you know, it sounds like it. But here's the thing. You, like, this is actually prophetic. Okay. Because when you look up the word cornerstone in your Bible... Okay, I can't remember how many references there are. I think it was like 11 or 12 references okay, of the word cornerstone. Did you know every time it's about Jesus Christ? Every single time. Let me just show you some examples. If you can uh, keep your finger there in Job and go to Acts chapter 4. Go to Acts chapter 4 and verse number 10. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 10. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 10. Which reads, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. So we have Christ, who is this stone, all right, and he's become the head of the corner. This is about the corner stone, which is Jesus Christ. Can you please now turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 12. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 12. Ephesians chapter 2 
and verse number 12. Remember, we're talking about the foundation of the earth. Well, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number, sorry, 20. Did I say 12? 20. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 20. It says, and are built. This is us. We've been built, okay, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So here in this passage, we see the foundation mentioned. We see the cornerstone mentioned, okay, which is the same, you know, uh, uh, descriptions that God used in Job 38. Okay, but, you, and again, I haven't got time to go through all this. You look up every time, all 11 or 12 passages that speak of the cornerstone, I guarantee you, you're, you're constantly going to end up, you know, concluding this is about Jesus Christ. Okay, this is about Jesus Christ. Now, if you go back to Job 38, and we start thinking, okay, yeah, God is speaking about creation, but now he's speaking prophetically of Christ. You know, is this a legitimate, you know, thought? Is this a legitimate, you know, way of, of looking at this passage in Job 38, in verse number 6, let's look at it again. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So we know when this cornerstone was laid, the morning stars sang, and the sons of God shouted for joy. My question, which I don't have an answer, I've not been given an answer for, is if the sons of God shouting for joy here are the angels. Well, then who are the morning stars that are singing? Because are there not two groups here? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Well, let me put it forward to you that the morning stars are the angels. The morning stars are the heavenly hosts. And the sons of God here are human beings, saved human beings, believers of Jesus Christ. Do I have any passages in the Bible to prove this? Absolutely. Okay. First of all, let me just say one thing. that This term morning stars, that's the only time it appears in the Bible. Okay, this is not to be confused with Jesus Christ, who in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have set mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So one title that is given to Jesus is the bright and morning star. But one title given to whoever these people are, I'm going to say it's angels, okay, are the morning stars. So, yeah, morning stars, I guess they're bright, they're, they're, they're full of light, and they're wonderful. But even greater than that, even more excellent than that, is the bright and morning star. The, the one bright and morning star that is mentioned in Revelation 22, which is the title to Jesus Christ. Okay? So, and then we have the sons of God shouting for joy. So, you know, I propose that the morning stars are angels, and the sons of God here are human beings. All right, so let's go to Matthew 21, please. Matthew 21 and verse 42. Matthew 21, verse number 42. And again, this is another reference to the cornerstone here. In Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Okay, so when this cornerstone was laid, okay, and again, these are the writings of the, the, the scriptures, the prophets, the prophets that wrote the scriptures, they said when this, morning, when this uh, cornerstone was laid, it was marvelous in our eyes. Well, that doesn't prove that they shouted for joy. That's right, that doesn't prove that, okay? But now go to John chapter 8, verse number 56. I just want to show you there that when the cornerstone is mentioned, this was marvelous in the eyes of the saints. Okay? But in John chapter 8, verse number 56, please. John chapter 8, verse number 56. Christ says in John 8, 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. He saw it and was glad. What did Job say? In the, sorry, in the book of Job, it said, uh, where the sons of God shouted for joy. So what do we have here? Abraham rejoiced to see my day. So when Christ came to this earth, you know, Abraham up in heaven with all the saints, were like, yes, woo! They rejoiced to see the day of Christ. Sounds like to me they're shouting for joy. Sounds like to me. They say, well, what about the morning stars? Did they sing together? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 2 and verse number 11. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 11. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 11, which reads, 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel, sorry, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So do we have the angels here now rejoicing? Yeah. Okay, we have the angels now as well with the announcement of Christ being born in Bethlehem this day. And so if I want to build my doctrine what the Bible says, Okay, and we have these two groups, the morning stars and the sons of God, you know, being happy, singing, praising God about, the, about Christ being laid on this earth, the cornerstone. Hey, we do have passages of the sons of God, you know, being uh, rejoicing. We do have the morning stars, if these are the angels here, you know, uh, singing the praises of God, you know, shouting uh, goodwill toward men. So to me, you know, again, I want to build my doctrines on things that I can read. You know, things that are in the Bible, even, even when things may be a little bit hazy, you know, ideally you create something of what you've seen or you read in the Bible rather than what you've not read. Okay, because what you've not read or, you know, making an argument for silence can contain errors. It can contain errors, okay? Now, the question, the conclusion of the sermon basically is this. Well, then who are the sons of God in Genesis 6? Well, can you please back, go back to, uh, actually go to Genesis chapter 4. Go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. And again, if you believe this and I'm not convincing you, I have no problem with you. I don't think you're a heretic. <laughs> okay. I don't think you're a heretic or anything like that. I know sometimes we can get really attached to doctrines that we you know, thought we studied out and believed, but you know, even I sometimes have had to make changes in certain things that I've believed. You know, just just uh, concepts and ideas, especially when you kind of study out and you start to see the kind of conflicts that it creates in other passages of the Bible. But who are the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6? Remember when I said when you get to Genesis 6, you should have read Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? And what we read in Genesis chapter 1 is that everything brings forth after its own kind, very clearly. When we get to Genesis chapter 2, we see very clearly that marriage is between one man and his wife. Okay? Now, Genesis chapter 3 is about the fall of man, but in Genesis chapter 4... Look at verse number 25, Genesis chapter 4, verse number 25. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, sorry, for God said she, have appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So we have in Genesis chapter uh, 4 this, this sort of this uh, phrase that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Again, going through this lineage from Adam to, um, to Seth, from Seth to Enos. And of course, this is a phrase that we should be all very familiar with. You know, in Romans chapter 10 verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when we call upon the name of the Lord in faith, we believe on Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, we become the sons of God. Amen. Okay? So when we get to Genesis chapter 5, look at verse number 1. Genesis chapter 5, verse number 1, it says, This is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. And then we go through all the genealogy, the, the, the descendants from Adam to Seth to Enos that called upon the name of the Lord. And so when we get to Genesis chapter 6, when we know that called upon the name of the Lord makes us the sons of God, when we get to Genesis chapter 6, it should naturally, you know, in the natural flow of the Bible there. You should, I think, you should conclude, right, that the sons of God there are believers that took the daughters of men, they took wives. You know, it sounds like they took unsaved wives. That's my conclusion. And this was a problem in the sight of the Lord. Okay? You say, what about the giants, the men of renown? What about all this kind of stuff? I haven't got time to go through all of that. Okay? But men of renown basically means famous. Okay? Famous, famous men. And sometimes, you know, the word giant, even in our own um, vernacular, sometimes the giant, we, we tend to refer to that to famous people. We might say this is a, a giant in soccer. You know, Cristiano Ronaldo is a giant in soccer. 
You know, Michael Jordan is a giant in basketball. You know, sometimes we use this phrase, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's what it means. I actually believe it's talking about big men there. But anyway, that's a, that's a different topic altogether, okay? But the main conclusion that I wanted to, to cover there, brethren, is that Genesis 6, the best understanding, I, I think just the, the natural reading of the book of Genesis, also understanding that angels cannot and never have been called the sons of God, should just naturally con- make it conclude that the sons of God are believers. Therefore, the angel procreation doctrine is a false doctrine. Okay, hope that makes sense. Let's pray.